Uh, I'm Steve Donahue. I'm the editor of Fierce Cable. I've been uh, writing about the, uh, the cable industry for about uh, 15 years, and uh, the last couple of years uh, I've been writing a lot about uh, mobile video and TV everywhere, and uh, I'm thrilled to have the panel that, that Tracy has recruited here today. So uh, let, me, let me introduce our, our speakers. Uh, David Al Granati is SVP of TV Product Innovation at Rentrack. Uh, Jeremy Helfand, who you just heard from, he's uh, VP of Adobe Primetime. Chris Faw is SVP of Operations at Time Warner Cable Media. Matt Strauss is SVP and General Manager of Video Services at Comcast. Sherry Brennan is SVP of Sales, Strategy, and Development at Fox Networks. And Mark Garner is uh, SVP of Business Development, Analytics, and Distribution Marketing at A&E Networks. So uh, I'd like to start by thanking Chase Carey for uh, giving us a, a good topic to start off on. Um, Chase spoke at a uh, UBS conference yesterday, uh, and he talked about uh, rising programming costs and how TV Everywhere could uh, help programmers drive increased uh, collect increased license fees and, and also add more value for the consumer. Uh, he said, quote, TV Everywhere is on the right path, but it has been poorly executed. We have to be part of the solution. Um, so uh, I wanted to open that up to the panel. Uh, what, how can TV Everywhere uh, drive, you know, be part of the solution and, and drive increased value to the uh, subscription bundle? Well, I'll start since and, it's my boss who said that. And this is uh, one of the ways that Sherry is, is increasing the value of the bundle with uh, some Fox oh, yeah. TV everywhere else. That was me personally, okay. too, just so you know. Okay. Um, no, but first of all, if you go back to that slide, I just have to point out yes. a couple of things. Mm -hmm. It's 21st century Fox, not 20th. Just okay. so everyone knows, yes. we changed our name. Okay. Um, so Thanks. either that quote was a year ago or, um, or the company name is wrong. Type but I yes. think this Thank is you. a really great way to start because what we've always, what we've thought at Fox for a long time, what I thought when I was at Cablevision and before, is that the pay TV uh, proposition, the economic proposition, is still a, a fabulous value. And I'm pretty sure those stats that uh, Chase quoted were put together by John Choi, who's here somewhere, who works on my team. Um, and we've done a lot of work uh, looking at relative value. And I think it doesn't get, like there's a lot of talk about programming costs being high and um, people not having a lot of disposable income and things like that. And those may all be true, but when you think about how much people are paying for cell phones and how much people pay for a cup of coffee mm -hmm. or to go to the movies or to go to a baseball game, mm -hmm. a $70 cable bill is a fabulous value for the huge amount of time people spend 250 hours a month watching it. So it comes out to something like 30 cents of, of an hour. And I don't know what else you can do besides walking in the park that's that cheap. So we do think it's a great value and, uh, and we think everybody in the room ought to be talking about that. And one of the things Mike Hopkins said uh, mm -hmm. at another conference uh, not too long ago is, you don't hear Costco complaining about how much Coca-Cola charges them. Mm -hmm. They just sell the Coca-Cola, <laughs> you know? And maybe they have to buy 7-Up too, I don't know. But mm -hmm. they, they sell the Coca-Cola. And so we, we really do think that we should all be singing from the same song sheet about what a great value the product that we all prepare, market, produce, and sell is. So that's my opening remark. Great. So. Matt and Chris, though, are you able to monetize this TV Everywhere content? I'll take a stab. Um, you know, one of the ways we do create value is certainly there's a subscription model, but there's also an advertising model, and, and that's very much what I'm involved with at Time Warner. So we have to make TV Everywhere as functional as the linear model was in the old traditional linear cable TV space. And that means making advertising uh, available not only to the, to the programmer, but to the local uh, folks who need to sell that. And the interesting thing about TV Everywhere is you can actually make that more powerful. You can make that more relevant to the, the consumer. Um, it's measurable. Uh, it's certainly more functional. It's more complicated, I'll tell you, on the operations side. But there's, there's a lot more runway and a lot more possibility in the TV Everywhere model. And, and that's what gets us excited and gets us coming in every day. So 
that hasn't been defined yet, exactly how we're going to share in that advertising model and how we're going to work together with the programmers. But I think it, it goes a long way to help paying that. That's the reason the 30 cents is probably not 40 or 50 cents is because there is an advertising model. And there is an understanding from the consumer that, you know, nothing is free. And if I can, you know, sit through a couple of relevant messages and still get my program, that's, uh, that's even, even better value. Um, you know, TV Everywhere is actually, if you kind of take a step back, it's part of a much broader strategy. It's one facet of our strategy, which is very simply, uh, as Jeremy said, you know, give our customers what they want when they want it. And you can almost trace it back, you know, to, um, to the earlier days of On Demand. It's very similar when we launched On Demand 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. It was giving customers the ability to access the content they paid for, but it was primarily about adding value. Um, you know, at the time, the industry was very focused on pay-per-view and, um, and transactional movies. We looked at on-demand as an opportunity to add more value to the bundle and give customers the ability to watch what they want when they want it. If you look at TV Everywhere, it's really just a component of that same strategy, you know, which is now extending the content experience, not just on the TV, but effectively untethering it and letting customers access it where they want when they want it. And that was part of the principles when we developed TV Everywhere um, several years ago. But for anything to be successful, you know, you always want to start with the customer, but it also has to work for every party involved. There's rights, there's monetization that has to happen, there's measurement that has to happen, um, there's awareness. So all these pieces need to be put in place to have, you know, kind of an effective execution of this. Um, and I think that you know, you're starting to see those pieces come together. You know, you're starting to see some of those hurdles where you have critical mass of programming um, that's now available, you have critical mass of, of devices um, that are accessing it, and you're, you know, you're starting to see some of those pieces come, come into place. Um, so Comcast struck a, a, a unique deal with uh, Disney last year. Uh, it's a multi-platform carriage deal. And, and Fox. Yeah. And Fox. That's right, and Fox. So, uh, so I, I have the, uh, the Watch ABC app up on the screen, uh, and uh, so, this, this deal that Comcast struck allows it to offer uh, live linear programming from uh, Fox, ONOs, uh, on iPads and other mobile devices, and uh, you're able to uh, deliver targeted advertising. Um, other broadcasters uh, are, are pursuing other options. You know, CBS is, uh, uh, you know, working with Dial. Uh, you know, the, the carriage deals they've done don't uh, offer those types of uh, targeted advertising, or, or they're not working with operators the way that uh, ABC is. Is this the model that broadcasters should be pursuing uh, in terms of authentic authentication and working with operators like Time Warner and Comcast? I just Chair, think, uh, yeah, I think the broadcasters all have slightly mm -hmm. different strategies with, um, with this, but I think everyone's intention is to make their content available this mm -hmm. way. So when you talk about Dial, for example, Fox is one of the owners of Dial, NBC is involved with Dial. So that's not, uh, those aren't mutually exclusive, mm -hmm. right? This kind of an arrangement, I think CBS's strategy is a little different because they don't have the same cable network portfolio. ABC puts a lot of eggs in the ESPN basket, obviously, so mm -hmm. monetization may be sort of spread a little bit differently um, than when you look at like a CBS where they probably are monetizing platform by platform, I think. So I think it's just different ways to get to the same solution and I and I do think over time it will converge to a less confusing consumer proposition because I think it has to. Great. There doesn't seem to be uh, a lot of consistency though in terms of uh, the approach that each broadcaster or network is taking. Is that is that something that the industry needs? Uh, Jeremy, do you have any thoughts on that in terms of uh, should uh, cable programmers and broadcasters have uh, uh, you know, similar interfaces, similar approaches to TV everywhere. Yeah, I, mean, I think I think the expectation from the consumer perspective is that it's gonna it's gonna work like TV. You know, you go to a store, you buy a TV, you go home, you plug it in, and all your content's there. As a consumer today, you have to be concerned whether or not the content you want is supported on an iOS device versus an Android device, smartphone versus tablet. Can I get it on my Xbox? And I think ultimately, um, I think it goes back to the value discussion earlier that the the experience needs to be consistent for the consumer to really take advantage of it. Because you know, I know, I know my 13-year-old daughter, she gets frustrated when she has a hard time finding the content she wants when she, she knows it's available somewhere. And so 
you know, I, I do think there's an expectation from the consumer that discovery becomes easier, that, you know, the, the easier you make it, as I was saying earlier, the easier you make it for the consumer to get access to the content and it's cons and consistently uh, there, you know, the more they're going to consume. And that's, that's the great opportunity for what we're talking about is, you know, we're talking about total media consumption growing. And so there, you know, not only is there a great consumer opportunity here, but there's a great business opportunity because the, you know, you know, the rising tide is affecting all the boats. And so that's, you know, that's the opportunity here. And there might also be some rights that are unexploited today. So I think MVPDs are gathering rights. And if you have to, I mean, Matt, you could probably speak better than me to this, but if you don't have a critical mass of rights as a pay TV operator, you're not going to launch, like, you know, maybe they've got CBS, they're not going to launch only CBS. So mm -hmm. I do think it's, it's taking too long. Of, co of course, I would agree with that. But, but I do think it's a sort of iterative, and over time, it, I think the models will converge. Mark? Yeah, I, I'd also like to comment. I think the consumers want a consistent experience, but I think that those of us in the ecosystem want a consistent experience also. I, I have to tell you, it amazes me that I can go from, or anybody can go from one uh, uh, discussion between parties to another discussion par between parties and find such vast differences in the approach to technology and the approach to monetization and the approach to the presentation of content. And, you know, the question becomes, well, why can't we get our act together? You know, we, we've got these entities like Cable Labs for technology. We've got these entities like CTAM for marketing. We've got these discussions and these forums like the ones we're having today. And for some reason, we can't get our act together to talk about, you know, how come we can't monetize the most basic, you know, assets in an on-demand or broadband on-demand environment where it's been happening in the digital environment for years, but only one or two distributors have the ability to do it? That just blows my mind. Yet there's an absolute demand for this content in every negotiation to be presented in such a way, but there's no consideration given to, um, you know, the, the, the things that we all say are important, monetization, presentation, the network effect. So uh, a little contrarian here. So, so Mark, I, I think you said two things that were very important. One is the monetization model, because somebody's got to pay for all this. And, and the second thing was the ecosystem, the, the sort of the back room, how do you bring it all together? And uh, I think some of that is starting to happen because what we're seeing at Time Warner as we're, we're putting these disparate platforms and, and devices together, they're starting to look more alike so, uh, and more alike than they are different and, and the way they used to be. So uh, whether it's an ESPN watch app that we're serving or whether it's our own TV everywhere application that we're serving and whether we're working with a, a network partner or doing it all with our own content, we're starting to see some similarities in terms of reporting, or how we get the uh, actual advertising out there, uh, how we split the avails, um, how we talk to each other, how we go to market with that, how we put it together. Um, so it's a little confusing right now, um, but uh, it's less confusing this year than it would have been last year. And I can tell you that the progress that we've made uh, has actually given me great hope. I, I would have been a little more confused last year on this panel than I am now based on the work that we've done and the learnings that we've done. And that's with programmers and with our own technology as far as serving the ads and getting that ecosystem right. So uh, it's not all here right this second, but hang on, it's coming. Uh, and, and it will be uh, even sure. sharper as, as the days you know, unfold. Um, yeah, just one other, you know, we, um, we look at it maybe a little bit uniquely. We're, we're not trying to actually determine what the right model is when it comes to advertising. I think you're gonna see a lot of experimentation from programmers, and there very well may be certain platforms that lend themselves to different types of advertising models, formats, maybe even different monetization models. You know, we just want to provide the tools. Okay. So we want to allow, if the customer wants it to be, if the customer to us being the programmer in some respects, wants to use C3, we want to make sure we support Nielsen. If the customer, the programmers want to um, use dynamic ad insertion, we want to have dynamic ad insertion deployed across all of our platforms. If they want it to be addressable or interactive, we want to have those capabilities. So we've been very focused on creating the tools to allow the programmers to determine what's the best way to monetize their content and to ensure that the ecosystem grows. And our hope is that this isn't proprietary. We're not trying to create even proprietary technology. It's really to try to create some best practices that we can then use to standardize some of these models and ultimately, the industry will level set on what are the right tactics and the right integration. But I think you're seeing a lot of experimentation, which to me is, is good because ultimately it will get us to the result of, of where ultimately okay. the industry wants to get to. So speaking of experimentation, we've, uh, we've seen, uh, I don't know, if anyone familiar with Panthera partners? So 
Uh, Michael Wilner, the former CEO of Insight, uh, founded Panthera, and uh, they're working with companies like Comcast, I believe, to uh, offer uh, download-to-go content. And uh, I'm hearing a lot about expanded basic networks uh, looking to uh, offer subscribers the ability to download content and have uh, advertising uh, downloaded to the, those devices as well. So um, I just wanted to, to get uh, your take on uh, this approach. Uh, well, I'll tell you, Matt, we, sorry, we think it's the right approach. Any place mm -hmm. that uh, consumers can get our content, we want to be able to monetize those eyeballs. I think we're doing a great job in terms of working with our distribution partners to figure out how to get it to them. You know, some of the things I mentioned mm -hmm. earlier aside, but this is just, this is a fantastic feature. I mean, I, I think this is one of the game changers in terms of TV everywhere is being able to take this content truly anywhere you want and not have to worry about a connection. And at the same time, being able to serve them relevant messages and monetize that. Uh, this, is, this is a big win for everybody if we can make it work. How soon do you think we'll see uh, programming from A&E networks available for uh, download to go? Uh, That's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, sooner rather than later, I'll tell you that. Uh, I think, you know, we're, we're working with some of our partners mm -hmm. on that. We're working on this complexity around the ads, and we believe it's a great feature. We believe it's a forward way to look at things, and um, we're ready to go there, and we've, we've made that commitment with some of our partners, and now we're working together to make it happen. Yeah, we, um, you know, there's kind of three waves. You know, the first wave was on demand, just mm -hmm. offering the ability to access the on demand content across platforms. And that's probably where we focused most of our efforts for the first few years. Download is a feature we now have. We have about four to 5,000 assets that we offer on a download basis, temporary download basis. Mm -hmm. um, and as Mark said, it, it really is a killer feature. It's not, it's not a feature that you would use every day. But it's a feature that really delights you when you need to use it, like you're going on a plane or you're somewhere that doesn't have a very strong connection. So it's a very important component to the experience. Um, and, when, and the customers who use it love it. But the third wave um, is going to be live. You know, so on demand, download, and live. And, and that's kind of the progression that we've been steering towards. And I think we're starting to see others move in that direction as well. David, what kind of challenges would, uh, would you know, measurement firms like Rentrack have in measuring uh, download-to-go content? It's a good question, and uh, I think uh, you know, one, of the, one of the challenges with the, just the general fragmentization is that um, just like there's different consumer experiences and different monetization models, there's different data capture mechanisms, and they're all over the place. So in order to get a, a, a more comprehensive view of who's consuming this content, uh, it, it does pose a challenge because there's you know, 10 different ways to consume the content as opposed to one or two just four years ago. So th that's a challenge. From, from Rentrax perspective, we obtain that information through partnerships with yeah, uh, MVPDs, and uh, it's uh, we're we're up to the challenge in mm -hmm. the sense that uh, we're used okay. to collecting a lot of data and processing it. Okay, but I'm I, I sorry to uh, no. jump to the next slide there, but it was just on on this topic. Uh, the, the CEO of Icom talked about uh, he's having challenges monetizing the content uh, because of measurement. So uh, my next question was going to be, you know, what improvements can be made and uh, measuring multi-platform content. I want to open that up to the panel. Right. Well, but, my, uh, I, and I, I think from there's a understandable hesitancy from a content provider perspective to make content available uh, everywhere. Mm -hmm. I want to make it available where they can best monetize it, and that's where the measurement I think comes into play. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's you know. Ways to improve it are, in part, uh, agreeing on metrics. So mm -hmm. what are the metrics that we're going to judge by? So you know, Matt had mentioned, oh, well, if, uh, if, you want, if you're interested in C3, we can use Nielsen. If you're interested in addressable, we can do this. But that, uh, I'm not sure that that's a sustainable model in terms of everyone choosing their own standard by which their buy is going to be judged. Right, uh, and maybe that's, I don't want to put words in your okay. mouth, but. Um, Mark, Sherry, thoughts on uh, how can we improve measurement? 
you know, we've done a, a great job of beating up on Nielsen, for example, for the last couple of years, and I think they're stepping up and expecting in, what, September of 2014 to be able to do some measurement that we've all been asking for. Now it's our turn to step up and do what's necessary. So things like tagging our, our content with ID3, things like uh, the develop, both the, the programmers and the distributors um, uh, executing the SDKs that are necessary to be able to read these things. It's now our turn to step up you know, and give them the opportunity to do it. We can all sit here and bash the measurements and systems and everything, but I think they're, they're stepping up and now we have to put those things into place and uh, communicate those very well out to the buying marketplace as well as to how this is going to work, how it all comes together, how it works separately. Um, so we've got an education to do as well as some operationalization to do. And I, and I think uh, the unique thing about this type of advertising, it is a connection. There is a one-to-one -one connection. And if we don't take advantage of the technology that's available, then shame on us. And you think about the challenge that we gave Nielsen and Rent Track and, and some of these others years ago, which was we're just going to throw it out there and sample a few boxes and see what comes back. Um, we now have it within our wheelhouse to take care of that because we know who's connected, when they authenticated, how long they watched, um, and then we know something about them. And we also have the chance for them to have some interactivity along with that. So if we don't get it right, shame on us. I, I think we, we certainly have it within our functional, technical capability to do it. So uh, I, I just also, I want to applaud Matt and his team and his company for actually stepping up and listening to the content providers also. I think many of you probably read the articles last week about ODC3. I think that those who are really listened are trying to find creative ways to deliver value in this on-demand and these new environments. And I think now, instead of sort of sitting around and waiting to see how it plays out, we mm -hmm. just have to jump in. We, we got to just jump in and start doing it. Mm -hmm. um, you had mentioned authentication, and, and Jeremy, you talked about authentication uh, in your presentation as well. Uh, I have a slide of uh, a social login authentication that uh, Cinecor launched and a small cable operator named Midcontinent, Midcontinent is using. Uh, and my, my question is, what other uh, new approaches to authentication uh, should the industry be taking a look at? I mean, you know, as, as many of you know, Adobe Pass is you know, essentially de facto standard for authentication because most content programmers and MVPDs use it today. Um, and we do a number of things around free preview and social login and, and things like that, single sign-on. Um, but at the end of the day, the thing that is going to get us where we need to be is we need to remove the consumer from the authentication process, ultimately. You know, it should happen behind the scenes, but we've got to develop ways in which we don't have to be involved as a consumer in providing username and password information in order to get access to that content. And in those instances where that's been tested and used, auto-authentication around the Olympics, things like that, um, you know, Matt will tell you, they, they saw great results from it. So, yeah. um, you know, ultimately we, we've got to get the consumer out of that process. So we're at yeah. the... I've actually Sorry. thought for a couple of years that um, there should be a way to pair a device with a set-top box mm -hmm. so that the set-top the set box could tell the device what it's approved for. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why that hasn't happened, because it seems like you could very easily tell the consumer, go sit in your living room and turn on your TV yeah. and, and, and wait until your app you know, flashes at you and you're or, authenticated. Or and as long as you yeah. do that you know, once a week or something, you stay authenticated. And then you have to limit the number of devices that can be paired to a set-top box or an account. But mm -hmm. I think if you could do that and let, let the set-top box tell the device what it's approved for, then that would sort of auto-enter all the credentials and you wouldn't have to have all this, this friction that we have right now. But you know, there must be something hard about that because it hasn't happened. <laughs> uh, well, you know, authentication, yeah. there's a lot of discussion around authentication. There's a couple of ways to look at it. Um, when you look at Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, every one of those services require a username and, and password. Um, and they wouldn't exist without, without it. So authentication isn't necessarily the problem. But what we've got to do is make it easier. Um, and we've got to do a better job of communicating the value of why you should even go through the process of being authenticated. Mm -hmm. And by the way, we shouldn't even call it authentication because no one even knows what that means, uh, at least not a consumer. So we've kind of approached it two different ways. Um, we haven't done exactly what Sherry's described, but I think we've come close, mm -hmm. which is um, based on what we did with the Olympics, we extended that same technology where if you're in your home mm -hmm. and you're an, a high-speed data sub and you're a video sub, which the vast majority of our customers are double-play subs, we auto-authenticate you in the home. So you don't have to 
type in a username. You don't have to type in a password. You can just go, for example, to XfinityTV.com. We call it HomePass. You try to watch any piece of authenticated content and it just plays. So, you know, to, to Jeremy's point earlier, you want to make it as frictionless as possible. But here's another piece of it that we've also got to think through, which is if you want to personalize the experience, I need to know who you are. Yeah. So there's a balance of make it easy, make it seamless, get the customer into the experience. But at the same time, if you want to create personalization, recommendations, you know, uh, play, you know auto playback across devices, there needs to be some level of identification. Um, I think that that's kind of the balance, balancing act that we are kind of, um, we're kind of trying to navigate through. But going to this point forward, um, I think auto authentication has been a huge step forward for us. And it's one that, you know, we hope other distributors will also embrace. So, um, and, and I would just add, I mean, there, there, there is a lot of discussion to, to Mark's point earlier around standards. I mean, that TV everywhere and that process, I think, was an early Indi you know, indication of what you can do when you create a standard that the entire industry uses. And while we need to remove the consumer from the process, still get the credentials so that yeah. you can personalize the experience, but remove, you, it, it opens up the opportunity for the entire industry. The OATC and the work that's continuing to go on is really important there. Um, you know, we participate, a number of programmers participate in that to make sure that we do take off, you know, the verification process to the next level. Great. Uh, so Sherry talked about pairing devices. Uh, I've written a lot the last several months about uh, near field communication and the idea of uh, tapping a, uh, a phone to a set top or um, Matt, Brian Roberts at the cable show showed a new remote control. Um, I was wondering, you know, will that remote contain a, an NFC chip that a Comcast subscriber could use to uh, tap to his iPad or an iPhone uh, or a connected TV and authenticate uh, uh, that way, and could you also tap? Um, could you also use that to uh, personalize content? Where you know, if my son uh, taps his uh, phone to the set top, uh, he he would get a personalized program guide. Um, so so yes, I mean okay. in the future, mm -hmm. yes. I mean re really, where we're where we're heading is you know if you think about something like the DVR, um, you know DVRs are about fifty percent penetration. But if you look at 18 to 49 year olds who have DVRs, it's probably closer to 70% penetration of those devices. The DVR is a very basic technology, um, but they're very, people who have it are very passionate, very low churn rate on a DVR. Why? It doesn't have everything. It just has what you want. So um, that, that level of personalization is ultimately where you're gonna see TV everywhere and TV generally start to move, which is don't show me all the choices, just show me the things that I wanna see and in a very seamless, personalized way, whether it's live, on-demand, or DVR, those lines are gonna to start to get blurred. When you start to remove some of the friction out of the process, like auto-authentication, you then start to move towards things like you're describing, which is, well, if I know, if you're in the living room, and you have your phone, and you have credentials on that phone, I should be able to know who you are in a way that I can start to personalize that experience, whether it's my 10-year-old, or whether it's it's me, and that's kind of the next evolution of some of the development that we're currently looking at doing. Okay, great. Um, Jeremy, do you look at that? Are there any uh, you know? Could you give us a uh, a look at any next generation approaches that Adobe might look at? Would it include NFC? How about biometric devices? Uh, could I uh, authenticate uh, through? pacemaker eventually. <laughs> you know, what's interesting is where, when you think about where we are in the evolution of television, mm -hmm. I mean, with, um, with Adobe Primetime, what we've been focused on, what we've heard in the industry is, you know, I, I need to be able to reach my audience across devices so I can get scale. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to um, monetize those experiences. Mm -hmm. And then it is, how do I personalize and, and optimize that so I find the right balance between content and monetization. And that, that first element around reaching consumers across all devices is the one that the, the industry over the last, I would say, 12 months has really been um, focused on is how do I just make sure I can get to my audiences because that's been a real struggle. And, you know, what we, what we see in the business is, you know, for every time you stand up a new device, you have to find a way to get there. And so being able to standardize, to be able to deliver across all devices becomes, is really important just as you know, you plug in your television and it works. Same thing happens to ha have, has to happen with devices. The stat I showed earlier around tablets didn't exist three and a half years ago. 50% of all TV everywhere, more than 50% of all TV everywhere content is now consumed on a tablet. So 
being able to more easily get onto those devices is is paramount in order to be able to deliver on the, the promise of TV everywhere. Okay, great. Um, I write a lot about Glenn Britt, uh, the CEO of Time Warner Cable. He's actually retiring in a couple weeks, but uh, he talks a lot about the four Ennies, delivering any content, any time, any place, on any device. Um, could you uh, could you talk about you know what what devices are generating the most uh, usage in terms of uh, TV Everywhere content, um, Matt? I, or Chris, please. Yeah, I, I mean, I can tell you, and, and this may be shocking to this room, but the big TV in the middle of the living room is the one that's generating the most buzz right now. I was going to say the set-top box, too. So, yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, and, and we recognize that, and, and here's what we're seeing. I mean, they, they spend time with the set-top box and what you, know, what you talked about with the DVR. It's killer technology, uh, even though it's old and legacy, and it, but it, it works. It's, it's great aggregation of content. Discovery is easy. I can lean back, and I can, I can move around. So we're seeing that folks spend about five hours a day with that big screen. Now what we are seeing is there are more devices that are coming into the room and there's second screen and they're snacking and, and the way it works is they move down. Uh, you know, you, you said tablets because it's a little bit bigger and if you're really desperate and you're in a bus stop somewhere and you wanna watch, you'll watch on your Android and we'll serve it to you for 20 minutes. So you know, the best thing on TV right now is still TV. That's where our, our consumers are and they watch on the, on the big screen. Um, but as they move through the living room or they have somebody else in there, they're on those other devices and we recognize that. And then when we talk about things uh, like taking content on the go, we have to go with those consumers. So um, the, the same way uh, Glenn has uh, talked about making the content available to anybody, anywhere, anytime, any device, we're still working on the monetization model to make sure that we can monetize any device, anytime, anywhere with any consumer. And the good news about that is those ads become more relevant. They become more relevant to the programmer, the consumer, uh, and to us as a provider. If, if I'm not the guy who's gonna buy a $99 a month car, you don't need to keep serving me that ad. You know, the, uh, and that's not what we wanna do. That's not the experience we wanna create. And that's the great thing about these new devices. We don't have to do that. If, if you are eligible for the American Express green card, we're gonna send you the green card. If you're the gold card, we're gonna send you the gold card. So um, it, it really works all the way around. Um, but, but you ask, you know, which device, it's yeah. still the big screen. It's five hours a day, uh, which is amazing to me because somebody else has got to be watching more TV than I'm watching to make mm -hmm. it average up to five hours, but we're glad they're there. Uh, Matt, in terms of, uh, you, I, I, I read your blog posts about uh, TV Everywhere viewing. Are there any uh, devices that, uh, other than the TV that you've seen generate a significant amount of uh, usage? Well, you know, it's interesting because when we, when we developed TV Everywhere a few years ago, the tablet didn't exist. We were thinking PCs. It just shows you how you can't always predict what's going to happen in the future. Um, there's no doubt tablets and smartphones have been a catalyst for TV Everywhere. And you're starting to see a lot of consumption shift to those devices. Um, what's probably more interesting um, is the fact that where the consumption's happening. Because TV Everywhere um, has a great value of allowing you to take it with you, which again is a very, uh, very important customer value proposition. But the vast majority of the consumption is happening in the home. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, that may change over time, but if you see the consumption happening in the home and there's kind of that saying people will default to the best screen available in the home, um, and there's a lot of, um, you know, depending on your demographic, they don't even distinguish between those devices. So mm -hmm. you know, certainly if you're a younger demo like my kids, they're very happy to watch on a tablet uh, while my wife and I will take the big screen. Um, I think that you're, you're starting to see that. So then it starts to kind of lead into other types of discussion, uh, explorations of development, which is if a lot of the consumption is happening in the home, what does that then mean around the experiences you want to start creating around those? And those are the things that we start to think about. Um, and a lot of the viewing is happening in some cases while you're watching another screen. But I think we didn't expect that. You know, when we originally thought of TV everywhere, and we even call our app Xfinity TV Go. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you can take it with you anywhere in the country. You know, as long as you're verified, you can go and travel anywhere in the country and, and access your TV content. But it is interesting that it's, a lot of it's happening in the home, and there's definitely growth that we're seeing on tablets and smartphones. You know, don't you think that, that it'll be interesting to see how that changes as you get more rights for outside the home? Because right now, you have vastly more content you can deliver in the home than outside the yeah, home. Yeah, there's, there's no doubt, you know, we don't have true parity. Um, but if you, look at on, if you look at our app, um, we've done a pretty good job. We've got about 20,000 assets that we offer on demand. Um, and there's parity across a lot of big programmers. Um, we've done deals with a lot of the big programmers, Disney, Fox, Turner, 
all the premium networks, uh, NBC Universal. So I think we've made significant progress there. A and E. I'm sorry, A and E. Of course. <laughs> Uh, I just, you know, they were first, right? I, you know what, you I, forgot them because they were yeah. first. The, the, no, the problem was I was trying to watch them on the plane. I couldn't download the content, so I. Uh, so I don't think Xfinity <laughs> has TV content for download yeah. yet. Um, so, but 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 to, to, but yes, Sherry's point. You know, as we we just launched live TV mm -hmm. a few weeks ago, where you can now stream 35 networks live, and there's no doubt that could change. That could change the paradigm with live TV and sports and news where you start to see growing consumption happen out of the home more. Okay, Sherry. I was going to say, I, was say, I mean, that is what's interesting about, it's not, you know, the type of content that is being consumed is yeah. changing quickly too. I mean, you know, working with Xfinity, Turner, you see, you know, more. It's you're moving from on-demand content to also live linear content being available on those devices. And cool. so I think that, that pattern of change is, is really interesting too as more of those services are stood up. Um, Sherry, we, we had talked last week about the uh, opportunities to deliver advertising based on where a uh, subscriber is located. Could you, could you tell me about your thoughts on that? Could you, uh, I, I think you brought up the example of uh, if someone is, uh, you know, a, a soccer mom is watching a uh, Oh, I know a phone. what I said. Yeah, yeah. 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 So I was saying that to me, um, where a person is and the time of day mm -hmm. is more important in terms of what ad you want to deliver to them than knowing if they have a dog or a cat or mm -hmm. you know, a four-year-old or a 10-year-old. Because um, I think it's too hard to be right about those granular facts. But you can know that somebody's at a sporting field at 10 o'clock in the morning, which probably means they're watching their kid's game which probably means they're going to have a bunch of hungry mm -hmm. kids at noon, and so maybe you want to send them a pizza ad right then. That mm -hmm. was the example I was using. Or mm -hmm. that if you know someone's in New York and there's a snowstorm coming, it would be a good idea to send them an ad for snow tires or a mm -hmm. shovel as opposed to, or, or flights to Florida, as opposed to sending them you know, some ad for a, an above-ground swimming pool. Right? So that's kind of the thing mm -hmm. I was saying, is that I think the granul granular targeting of advertising just is too hard to get right. And, and also, you don't know if I don't have a dog today, I might be buying one tomorrow, or I might have to feed my sister-in-law's dog while she's on vacation. You know, you just don't know enough about why somebody might or might not buy something. So I really think ge geography and time of day are, are key. I, I, I think, coming from the advertising world at Time Warner, I, I think you're spot on. There's a lot we can tell already, even based on the legacy systems about who somebody is based on the programming they're watching or the time they're watching. And then I, I also wanted to say, even the device, because we found out through our work with ESPN and the Watch ESPN app, which we've been working with them uh, for over two years on, prime time, I hate to say it, is 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. on ESPN.com because people are at work watching ESPN. And when they go home and they have access to their big TV, they, they fire it up and, and they watch live on the big TV. So there were learnings like that. We would watch mm -hmm. the ESPN app actually drop at 4 uh, because everybody got in their car or they took their train home. And the app dropped off. So there, there are things even about the device itself, the time of day, the device they're consuming on, where they are, uh, that can tell you a lot about that consumer. And then where we are is groups of consumers. We want to reach groups of audiences. It's, it's very tough to chase the left-handed dog owner who doesn't have a golf club or whatever. But uh, <laughs> yes. it, if you can put together a meaningful group of advertisers and consumers and, and then market that, that works for everybody. Let's take a look at the uh, history app. I don't, can we play this video? That'd be great. And unfortunately, we don't have the audio, but uh, there we go. So when the ad's available, you can watch that offline. <laughs> it, it's a great app, but so should the cable subscriber be uh, using the History app or TWC TV or Xfinity TV to be watching that programming? I mean, do you have a preference, Mark? Of course I have a yes. preference. Okay. I mean, the political answer is to say they should watch yeah. wherever they go. We want them to watch on our apps and sites. Mm -hmm. However, we recognize that they are the, also the customer of the distributor. And people have different preferences. If they want to go someplace where they're looking for a plethora of content across different genres or different you know, uh, opportunities, they might want to choose to go to the MVPD site. If they're looking for a history experience, they may not be coming for just video. 
They may be coming for contextual information around the Civil War. They may be coming for uh, some of the games that we do. We have a lot of experience. We do history better than anybody else does history. I don't think Xfinity or Time Warner or DirecTV is going to do history like we do history. They do video and video aggregation and, and other experiences very well, and we want to be there as well. But we very specifically built these apps and built these environments because we want people to come to them. Um, so yes, we have a preference. Great. Um, let's talk about some uh, some fun topics here. So uh, you. You've heard a lot lately about the idea of uh, cable operators bundling Netflix or Hulu. Uh, John Malone uh, talked recently about, uh, he suggested that operators could uh, syndicate Hulu or they could even syndicate Xfinity. Um, you know, Comcast has talked about the idea of licensing the X1 platform and multi-screen programming to other operators. And we also have uh, Netflix is teaming up with Cablevision and Cox, Suddenlink, and some other operators to place uh, storage appliances near their networks. And uh, my, my question is, I mean, should, should cable operators be teaming up with uh, Netflix or Hulu uh, or even Xfinity to uh, offer multi-screen programming to their subscribers? Um, yes. I would open that up. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Sherry? Okay. No, I mean, I think, yeah. obviously, that was part of why Fox and a ABC didn't sell Hulu is because we thought there was an opportunity there. And mm -hmm. I think that, um, as, as Mark was saying, we like our network sites and apps, and the pay TV guys like their sites and apps. Um, but we recognize that Hulu is a really good aggregator as well and a good brand and a great place that people like to go to watch video content. So if you can sort of marry all that up together, I think you have a really good value proposition for the consumer, and I also think there's some sort of new media cachet that a brand like Hulu brings to uh, a brand like Comcast mm -hmm. or even Xfinity because it feels to you know, consumers like a new thing and, and like sort of the cutting edge, and I think that that perception would be really valuable to a pay TV provider. You know, there's something really interesting that's, that's happening um, with on-demand, and it's, it's interesting because on-demand usage for us on the set-top box had kind of hit a plateau a few years ago. About 70% of our subs use on-demand every month. Um, we just had our 30 billionth program viewed on-demand since we launched the platform. Um, and, and our customers use it. And about two years ago, we started to notice a trend that was happening. It was right, right after the Olympics, actually, where TV started to grow. Um, and it's been growing ever since. We're almost hitting an inflationary period where we're seeing 30 to 40% growth in TV viewing on demand than what we saw in the prior year. And I think there's a couple of things that are happening. One is we've done a lot more at creating more consistency. So we now have almost all the top shows available on demand um, and they're available with, you know, customers know that they'll be there when they go to on demand, which I think was a challenge in the past. And they're there on a timely basis, and we've moved from just offering four to five episodes at a time to full season. That's so, our, our real focus, and we've been nurturing this strategy now for a couple of years, has been to really hone in on TV, and primarily to look at TV viewing during the C3 window. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what we're finding, I'll just give you an example, um, and then I'm gonna answer your question, but um, yeah. what we're finding, if you look at something like The Sound of Music, I don't know how many people here watch The Sound of Music, you don't have to admit it if you, uh, but it was like the top rated show for NBC, um, probably the, I think it was the top rated show since ER finale five years ago. If you look at that usage in the ratings in Comcast households versus non-Comcast households, we did about the same. You know, the live rating was about the same in our households versus non-Comcast households. What's interesting though is when you look at the L plus three ratings. When you look at the L plus three ratings, we were about 26% higher. Now, if you dig a little bit deeper and say, well, why is that? Well, I can tell you, Sound of Music was the number one viewed asset on our entire on-demand platform for the weekend. It was more viewed than any other asset we had. And it was the highest viewed asset in the C3 window. It had the full C3 ads, probably of all time. And when you look at that usage and you correlate yeah. that to the lift, there was a lift. So our focus has been on how do we continue to really own the current season? And, and based on the growth and based on the fact that we've, we've aggregated a very high-end, high-quality library for our customers, 
that's become more of a priority for us, is, is to really mine the 40,000 choices that we make available now just on the set-top box and to continue to maximize the value around the current season. So if Comcast has all these relationships with programmers, you have a thousand engineers or more, um, you have X, the X1 platform, you have the X2 platform, I mean, is that, uh, can you take advantage of that and uh, license that platform to other distributors? Is it you know, we, um, we, are, you know, we are seeing really great results with X1. Um, and X1, um, it's now available across our entire footprint. And, you know, as well as on-demand has been doing for us historically, with X1, where you now have a more immersive guide, it's just one of the attributes of the platform where you've got recommendations. We've already seen probably a 25 to 26% lift in usage um, over, over our native guide. So when we look at that, that it's cloud-based and allows us to introduce new products like EST, which we just launched, mm -hmm. Um, we do think there's a value in, to Mark's point about how do you create consistency across the ecosystem. I do, you know, what we're learning with X1 and the development in the cloud-based guide and infrastructure, we do think could have value with other pay TV operators that, um, you know, that could help create more of that seamless experience, you know, not just regionally, but nationally. Okay. One last question on that is uh, Comcast has talked about, the, you know, the Olympics are coming up in a few months. Uh, are you looking at uh, using the Xfinity? Could that be the, your Olympics app instead of N the NBC Olympics app that you, you've used previously? Is that is that your way to take Xfinity <laughs> national is through the Olympics? No, 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 okay. no. And when I say national, yeah. I mean our our, yeah. our technology. Okay. Um, um, the no the the Olympics. You know, uh, Sochi. You know, we you know we we had seen unbelievable. Usage. I think London was, you know, I kind of considered it a watershed moment for TV everywhere because all the data and all the research showed that this was almost the first time anyone was ever watching live TV on a tablet or mobile device. Um, so when you look at Sochi, we're going to do everything we did with, for London with NBC and uh, that we're going to do for Sochi, but there's, there's definitely an appetite to raise the bar even higher. Um, and I think you're going to start to see us um, introduce some really, I think going to be some really innovative features. Um, that you know that you're going to hear more about in the coming coming months. Okay, great. Um, Chris, this is a uh, uh, I, I I I pulled this image uh, for the for the presentation. Could you could you talk about how uh, Time Warner Cable is using uh, TV Everywhere to sure. generate uh, local ad revenue? I happen yeah. to. Um, um, and actually, this is this is something we're very proud of. And, and I would pull out my app and do it live, but I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. but, um, you can watch now on an iOS device or on an Android device uh, 50 plus channels that are ad insertable. We've got more than 300 channels that you can view. It works beautifully. Um, but the most important part and, and the part that we think we're proudest of is we got that ecosystem part right. So if um, the linear ads are coming down, we can actually serve those ads in there. If we wanted to participate nationally and, and if there ever was a reason to change those ads on the fly, we have the technology to do that. And, and we're very proud to be first on that beachhead and, and get there with those uh, 50 plus ad insertable networks that support that ecosystem and those 300 plus choices that our, our consumers have out there. It, um, it's very surprising to me because even though I work in technology all day, I always say nothing works, but this works. Uh, and it's fantastic to see. And um, uh, we actually had, I don't know if we have it up here, but yeah. the first night we, we turned it on, we had uh, the guy sitting in a room with all these different devices fired up at once and watching the, the apps go by and it was like watching a baby being born so it was it was a very exciting time for us and um, we think we're in early days uh, but we've learned a lot and, and we're excited about the days ahead. Can you tell us the sixth platform that TWC will uh, TV will launch on soon? I could but I have to okay. kill you all, all right. so uh, okay. <laughs> right. All right. my guess was it's either uh, uh, Apple TV or Chromecast but um, I have no idea. That'll be a TV of tomorrow, we'll tell you that. So. Okay, we went through these. Um, and I'm sorry, I just wanted to go back to that. The, the last, one of the last slides I had, uh, we're actually uh, almost out of time. So I just wanted to ask one last question um, for the panel. Was, you know, where do you see TV everywhere five years from now? Um, any thoughts on, on where the industry is going? And you know, will it not be called TV everywhere? It will just be TV. Well, it's getting better yeah. to getting everywhere, mm -hmm. I'll tell you that. Uh, five years from now, I, I, I think you're going to see um, more ubiquity in terms of the experience across all the different platforms. There, there, there's going to be a sameness, which is a, you know, we're talking about consistency. 
uh, in terms of the content that's available on one device or one box or, you know, be it linear or on demand. And I think there's also going to be a, a, a sort of a sea change in terms of the way people discover the content. Um, so, and I think that's all good stuff for us. Great. Sure. I think I agree. I think it'll be everywhere. I also think what people think of as TV is probably different than what we think of as TV because we're so immersed in what TV means to us. But like my son thinks he's watching TV when he watches Netflix show on my tablet, right? And so I guess I think all of that has to converge and probably will in, in that time frame. And, that, and I don't think anybody will call it TV everywhere. I don't think they do today outside you know, our industry. Um, and hopefully they, they won't because that's sort of a functionality as opposed to a, an experience. Great. Uh, David. Sure. Uh, I, I think you know, get to a, a point where you know, the seams between content and distribution mechanism will be less and less clear. Uh, so it, people will, rather than saying, hey, TV everywhere or TV, it'll just be content. Like, I want to watch a ball game, or I want to watch a show, not I want to watch TV, because it'll be sufficiently ubiquitous that you're just identified with, with the, the content that you want to consume as opposed to TV itself is still a distribution mechanism. Mm -hmm. and, and those seams, maybe not in five years, but those seams will go away. Great. Jeremy? You know, t TV is no longer the device, it's the content. And five years from now, I think the industry will catch up to that, that concept. I don't think we'll be talking about TV everywhere. It'll just be television. 